Hi everyone, uh, just gonna get straight into the video. Just to let you know that this one is quite um, heavy from the get-go, so just a warning. So our story takes place on Saturday the 21st of December 1985 in Harlan Park, which is a housing estate in Clondalkin in Dublin. It was around 9.30 a.m. when a four-year-old Elaine went downstairs for her breakfast, but her mother hadn't made breakfast. Elaine found her lying face down on the floor in the sitting room. When she couldn't wake her mom, she went back upstairs to her parents' bedroom. Elaine and her three-year-old sister Karen told her dad, Michael Brady, that they couldn't wake mommy. Michael would go downstairs and it would appear that he tried to wake his wife before calling an ambulance. As the ambulance arrived, Gardy were not far behind. The state pathologist, Professor John Harbison, would say that 27-year-old Julia died from manual strangulation. Her face had also been severely beaten. She was lying face down, wearing only her husband's jumper, nothing else. Her clothes had been ripped from her. There was blood on the cushion that her face was lying down into and blood on her own jumper, which had been torn from her. From the very beginning, Gardy treated this as a murder inquiry. They asked for any witnesses to come forward who might have seen Julia the previous day as she had been out Christmas shopping or when she had arrived home. They also asked for anybody in the area between 11.45pm and 12.30am to come forward. Michael, who was also 27, was a labourer and he was described as a hard worker by his colleagues and as a quiet man by his neighbours. The couple had lived in the council house the last four years. Gardy kept quiet about who they thought was responsible and they would just say that, you know, they were chasing up leads, there was no kind of new leads, all this, but they were quietly focusing in on Michael Brady. It would be said that Julia's family would have an argument with, with either Michael himself or Michael's family at the mortuary where Julia's body had been brought and the argument obviously was so bad that Gardy had to be called. On Christmas Eve, Julia was buried in Glasnevin Cemetery. Her mother and father... Nellie and William Highland were among the mourners, as was their son, Martin. If you don't know the name Martin Highland, you might remember Marlow Highland. He would go on to be a big player in Ireland's gangland scene. But at this point, he was just Julia's 18-year-old brother who was starting out his career as a criminal. So I just want to say as well, I tried really hard to get photos of Julia and Michael, and I couldn't. I'm going to have another look again while I'm editing, but I haven't been able to. Marlow, there's loads of photos of him, so I can show you him and I can show you all the other bits. But yeah, I'm sorry that I, I can't give any pictures of them. Uh, I will try again. In early May 1996, Michael Brady was arrested at his home. The following day, he would be charged with the unlawful killing of his wife. Between the hours of 10 a.m. on the 20th of December to the hours of 10 a.m. on the 21st of December. Um, I never really understood why, you know, when you'd, you'd hear that, that's what a charge was. There was like a wide kind of window and I never really understood. But in one of the sources, it says that the reason they, they give the wide margin is so that when it comes to court, if they had more of a precise time and any evidence came up to, you know, kind of contradict that or could have been about, you know, out slightly from that, it could throw the case. So they charge it like this with a wide margin to, to make sure the case goes through. When charged, Michael said, I don't want to say anything. He was remanded to Mountjoy Prison without bail and he protested his innocence for a year until the 3rd of July 1987 when he pled guilty to manslaughter. Michael Brady finished work early on the Friday 20th for his Christmas party. It was said that him and some other colleagues actually finished off a bottle of whiskey between them before they even left the job. Michael then headed home, he changed clothes and headed off to the Belgard Inn Whereas, you know, where the party was actually being held, so it would have been free food, free drinks, all this. They obviously don't know how much he actually drank, but from, you know, other colleagues and stuff that they spoke to, they reckon he had between 8 and 14 pints of beer. That's a wide margin. What happened next, Michael would give different versions of the of the events. Gardy believe it wasn't that he was lying, it was genuinely that he, he didn't really know. Michael was in no state to drive, so he was dropped home by a colleague. Back in the day when everybody just drove when they were drinking. Um, so he was dropped at around 11pm. When he arrived in, Julia was polishing the furniture. You can just really picture that, like spending like that up at 11 o'clock at night, polishing the furniture because, you know, Christmas is coming up and 
you know, family will be over and all this stuff and everything has to be perfect. Michael at one point says that they then had, they both sat on the couch and that they then had consensual sex. So whether it did begin like that and then it became something else or could it have been from the beginning, Julia had said no, you know, tired, not in the mood, I'm polishing, whatever reason. And that he didn't take this as a no. We don't know because he won't, he, he didn't say the actual events. However, obviously there was kind of two pieces of evidence that led us to believe it wasn't consensual from the beginning. One was that, as I said earlier, Julia was lying face down on a cushion um, and there was blood on it. But there was also blood on her jumper that was taken from her body and she was then wearing her husband's jumper. So that would lead you to believe that she was already being beaten before the clothes had come off her. And then I'm not really sure why he would have put the jumper back, or her, like his own jumper back on her. I'm not really sure. And the other thing is, two years previously, Julia had been diagnosed as a diabetic. So they had two children. And the doctor basically told her that it would be unwise for her to get pregnant again. So a popular method of contraception at the time was essentially the withdrawal method or like pulling out or whatever, which isn't reliable. Please don't use it. I'm just going to read something because, you know, kind of it's interesting, obviously, but it just kind of gives you the context of why that's the method they use instead of because I was kind of like, oh, could they not use this or that or whatever, cause, especially because you are married. But um. Yeah, I'm just going to read some stuff. So in 1979 in Ireland, the Irish Family Planning Act was introduced and this allowed contraceptives, contraceptives to be sold under prescription. And then in finally in 1985, the laws did relax to allow the sale of condoms and spermicides without a prescription. However, because Ireland was very still like a typical conservative country, there were a lot of uh, pharmacies that just wouldn't stock it. It was said that around half of all chemists in the country refused to stock any condoms, meaning they were still rather inaccessible in certain communities. In 1987, a late, late extra broadcast touching on the AIDS epidemic sparked controversy as presenter Gay Bourne short, showed a short film on how to use a condom and he opened the condom himself to show the audience. He was worried that this open discussion and advertisement of condoms would create a condom mentality which was apparently a bad thing. And then I'd wondered, because I'm going to tell you the next part, I was wondering about like um, the morning after pill, emergency contraception, when that was available. And so it says, uh, the provision of emergency contraception has been licensed for use in Ireland since late 2001. But even at that point, you had to go to your doctor to get it with a prescription, like you couldn't, you can get it in boots and stuff now. Um, and I think, you get it in, I think you can get it in like the Irish family planning places. But at the time, it was like a doctor, so it was still kind of like that family doctors and all this jazz. But anyway, so at the point where the story is, that wasn't a thing. So they were using the withdrawal method. And it says, so it basically says um, that this was what they agreed that they would use the withdrawal method. And it says that Michael didn't go through with this on that night. So obviously that means that, you know, semen had been left in, you know, in Julia's body. So maybe it was at that point, that's when it was no, but obviously we know that he had already been savagely bleeding. And I know things can get carried away in case anybody's wondering about that. But again, the fact that it's not like you could get emergency contraception the next day, that she could have been very much like no. But I would believe that it was a no from the beginning because of the attack. And then to lead on from that, obviously more evidence is that there was a history of Michael assaulting Julia. So again, it could have just been that he came home, he was so drunk and, you know, she said something that set him off or something and he just decided to beat her and then it went too far. He beat her on her 21st birthday, like badly, and she was pregnant with Elaine at the time. So when it happened a second time, she moved out, she moved home to Cabra with her parents and she stayed there for four months. And then like that, Michael was like, you know, I'm sorry, I'll change, I'll do better. Everything that people in domestic violence relationships will say. And kind of one of the agreements was that he would stop drinking like whiskey and stuff because apparently that's what made him so bad, like he couldn't handle it. And you do hear people saying that like some people get aggressive on certain alcohol, certain spirits and stuff. And so obviously she had, and it is even said in one of the sources that when he has drank the whiskey on that day at work or whatever, like Julia would have been telling them like you need to be careful not don't be drinking whiskey you know all this 
and obviously he didn't listen. And so she moved home. Her mother Nellie would say that a few months before her death, Julia actually told her that she was like growing her nails out. And this was for if anyone was to lay their hands on me, but obviously, I mean, she meant Michael. If anyone was to lay their hands on me, I'd be able to scratch them and I'd be able to, you know, leave a mark or something. And then people would know if it went, you know, if, if something happened to me. This did actually prove to be helpful. So they found blood under Julia's fingernails. And I think it matched to like his blood type. That would have been all they had at the time. Obviously, there was no DNA or anything back then. Um, and he actually had marks on it, like scratch marks on his face and on his neck. That he said at the time a concrete block fell on him in work and that that's what caused the marks. From the beginning, Nelly said that she openly accused Michael of killing her daughter. She would say that the funeral director told her that it was like Julie's body was the worst case of a beaten body that he had seen. And he said that like the, there was a bone sticking out. So I don't think strangling alone would actually do that. I think there would have had to be a bit more. But I don't know why the funeral director would tell a victim's mother something like that. I, you know, I don't, I just, it's not going it, mean, to help her. So I don't know why you would give her that horrific detail. Psychiatrist Dr. James Behan would tell the court that Michael had a fear of abandonment and he did not trust women fully. And this was as a result of his mother leaving when he was a child. He said that he had subconsciously suppressed all traumatic like events in his life. And this included murdering his wife or killing his wife. It leads back to the guard. He's saying like he, it wasn't that they thought he was purposely lying. It was that he, he didn't actually really remember what he'd done. It was also noted that Michael was below average intelligence and illiterate. I just want to say here as well, like he left her there and went to bed. So he raped her, he murdered her and then left her there and went to bed. And like fair if you could use the excuse of, oh, well, you're drunk. So you weren't even thinking about the repercussions the next day of your daughters. But I just don't accept that as a valid thing to excuse you. Like to allow your daughters to find their mom like that you know what I mean four four years old like you're remembering things just as Frank Rowe noted how Julia must have been in agony for her last moments of life and sentenced Michael Brady he served his time quietly and was described as a model prisoner and he was released in February 1994 he was released with some conditions one being that he was not to contact his daughters who were now in their early teens so his daughters actually moved in with Nellie and William in Cabra and Nellie would actually say that they then began to call their man and dad. She also said that they had gone to see their dad to basically say like we're moving on with our lives and we don't want anything to do with you. After release Michael Brady lived a quiet life. He stayed out to drink, wish he could have done that before, and was working as a labourer again and he basically just tried to stay under the radar. So he was out about 18 months and so on September 5th, 1996, Michael Brady was driving home from football. He stopped at a garage to get some groceries and then headed to the underground car park near his apartments. So he lived in like a one bed flat in near Ellis Street um, at like Ellis Keys apartments. And so obviously there was like underground car park kind of a bit further away. So he would park there and then just walked a short distance to his flat. So he pulled up, put down his window and went searching in his pockets for his little swipe card. And this was at around 9.15 p.m. Just then a motorbike pulled up and the back passenger got off, walked over to the car and shot Michael Brady at close range four times in the neck and upper body. He then got back on the bike and they made their getaway. It is said that Michael, who still had a seatbelt on, would have died almost instantly and wouldn't have suffered. Something that he did not grant his wife. So, can you guess who was on the bike? Gardie knew. Newspapers knew. In fact, the Irish Times said, the Gardaí know a Dublin criminal had a long-standing grudge against him. And that was it. That was basically all they could say. And so Gardaí couldn't do it. The Gardaí knew who it was. They couldn't do anything about it. And so the murder of Michael Brady was never solved. No murder is bad. But I remember hearing this story um, and not knowing the, the characters in it, like the people actually in it. I remember being told this story by someone um, essentially like that, that they killed their wife or partner and that they, they went and they served their time and stuff. And it was after that that he was, you know, they got their revenge. 
not condoning it. I'm just saying it's sometimes karma is good. I'm not inciting. I am not inciting violence. By 2006, Marlow Highland had reached his peak. He had only ever been done for motoring offences, but was believed to be connected to a few murders. One of the sources says that um, people in the gangland line of work believed that having like a string of motoring offences was like a badge of honour because they couldn't get you on anything else. So, you know, this is what they would get you on. But rumours started going around that Marlow Highland was cooperating with Gardy and he was now in fear for his life. So on Tuesday, the 12th of December, 2006, he was actually staying with his niece, Elaine Highland. Because they grew up then, kind of in the same house, she actually considered him like a brother, not an uncle. So he was staying with her. It was reported that he would sleep with a samurai sword and would sleep like in different places for kind of like a few days and stuff at a time. He would just keep on the move. So this was in Scribblestown Park in Finglas. And around 9am, she left to drop her eldest child to school. There were two plumbers working in the house at the time, David Murphy and his apprentice, Anthony Campbell. Marla Highland was upstairs asleep. David left to go get some supplies from a local wholesaler. At around 9.20am, there was a knock on the door. 20-year-old Anthony answered. Two men with guns arrived in. One went upstairs and shot Marla Highland six times in the head. When David arrived back and no one answered the door and Anthony wasn't answering his phone, at this point Elaine arrives back and so they go into the house. Where they found Anthony dead with a gunshot to his head. It was said that his hands were raised up in a defensive motion. Anthony was described as innocent and hardworking, who was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Elaine would find her uncle upstairs dead. No one would be charged for these murders. So that's that one, guys. Um, I kind of just kept, I kept the rest of it in as well. Obviously, there was the kind of the first part and the second part, the revenge. But then I just thought I'd let you know what happened to Marlon Highland in the end. and. Um, Anthony Campbell I wouldn't remember that happening and it was like a shock to Ireland do you know what I mean because it was really like you know like they'd go after anyone now do you know what I mean because someone was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and could have been a potential witness and so they killed him they took his life I also wanted to put it in because like Elaine it's just you know she found her mother and then to find her uncle who she thought of as her brother like it's just it's all, you know it's just awful isn't it so that is that for this case Um, let me know what you think of it let me know do you like these kind of stories where it's like revenge do you like those tales um i'm hoping to have this video out thursday tomorrow thursday yeah and um i'm also going to be recording another one so hopefully that'll come out then maybe i mean again as i said before i should probably wait to put it up on like kind of sunday or something but i'll probably just put it up the next day because as i said i'm impatient i hope you're all keeping well um oh uh yeah so i want to do a live and a few people were like oh yeah that sounds good so i'm gonna do that i'm actually really excited nearly at 3000 subscribers so i'm kind of now panicking about like when do i do it when's the best time so i'm wondering would like an, a week midweek evening do like a wednesday or something or would a weekend be better like a saturday evening because I was kind of thinking, well, Saturdays, people are busy and all. And then I was kind of like, but maybe they have no life like me. And they're in on Saturday nights and this is something for them to do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can let me know if if you're not going to be out bopping away on a Saturday. You could let me know. We'll do it then. And, yeah, please let me know anyway. Okay, guys. If you haven't already, please subscribe, uh, like and comment. Let me know what you think of the video. Let me know if you have any case suggestions. And uh, let me know if you do like to hear like the kind of tales of revenge. Okay. Uh, we shall see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye.